the world is a quirky place. And that's exactly what I'm here to explore. Hi, I'm Don Pollock, and welcome to my world. The home of the offbeat, the fun, the bizarre, the place to come for exploring quirky. I didn't think there was a world speed record for doing whatever this is, and you'd be right. But that doesn't mean you can't establish one and have it sanctioned by a world-recognized organization. It's not just the drinks that are on ice, and a recreational pastime is one of the fastest growing in the country. Whole families are enjoying it together, like a miniature golf. But you don't need those teeny little pencils to keep score. And you can visit to a town that honors its most notable residents with an annual festival whose motto is Look Alive. Which is very good advice to heed when you're in the area. Whoa! Not exactly the bluebirds of happiness, are they? But before we get to them, I wanted to tell you the results of this recent survey that found that 55% of teenagers would rather send a text message on their cell phone than have an actual conversation. So much for complaining that young people today don't read enough. But there is a way to text without being connected to Wi-Fi or 4G or Kenny G or anything else. Heck, you don't even need a cell phone. If you're wondering how that's done, well, here are a few experts to spell it out for you. While texting is seen as a relatively recent form of communication, the fact is it has been going on for nearly 150 years. It just used to be a lot noisier. Don't mean a thing if it ain't got that thing. In a manner that's being kept alive by enthusiasts both old and young. I don't have a cell phone and I don't text. Celebrating the typewriter. Go. In regular gatherings that feature speed competitions. <laughs> that can clearly need more strict officiating. And an appreciation of the innovative spirit that embodied the machine that changed the written word. You have to remember the last quarter of the 19th century was the golden age of typewriter invention. There were wacky designs. Everyone wanted to increase productivity. Some of the early models hadn't quite figured out a shift key yet, so they had an entire lowercase set and an entire <laughs> uppercase set. All you needed was uh, an extra set of hands and yeah. you're all set. Uh -huh. well, There's so many different designs of uh, different typewriter layouts, keyboard layouts. This allowed you to put a dime in it to type for 30 minutes. So what we know as an internet cafe today was a typing cafe back in the old days. There were original ergonomic keyboards where all the keys were in a, in a circle. Ideas that wound up as museum curiosities, but with an aspect that to this day still impacts all of us. And ironically, the legacy that it left behind was the QWERTY keyboard. An arrangement of the alphabet that uh, anybody who's learning how to keyboard always finds ridiculously confusing and, and hard to use. But what they don't realize is, it was meant to be. There was a need to slow the operator down a little bit. The type bars would jam whenever you would type too fast. The keys were all placed in a manner that would keep frequently used keystrokes from colliding. Something that obviously no longer applies in our computer age, but yet... I, it just stuck. That's just, that's what happened. It just stuck. It's crazy, but <laughs> it lives on. An enduring link to an endearing writing heritage. It is fun. Just the clanking, putting the words right on the paper. That will continue to be a connection to the origins of our texting culture. I'm Don Pollock. The latest word from my world. Coming up, our quest for quirky reveals how you can have a dream home that looks like this and you won't have to squander your whole nest egg. In fact, you might even gain a couple. They may be the springtime scourge of the suburban front lawn, but thanks to some creative chefs, dandelions can be the main course in a wedding or banquet. Of course, the dandelion wine makes it all go down a lot easier, I'm sure. And I'll take a look at the finer points of another culinary challenge. How would you enjoy one of the world's legendary romance-inducing foods without well, first ending up in the hospital just trying to get at it? All that and more is coming up in my world. Experts may spend their days studying the economy. It's a subject that can also inspire exploring quirky. We all know that the housing market is a big part of the economy. When prices are going up, 
then up, then up. Well, everything is great, but when the bubble bursts, well, we all know the results of that. But it turns out we don't have to entirely abandon our hopes of owning our dream house. As one contractor has discovered, it's just a matter of making a small adjustment. While the housing market has become wildly unpredictable, people are still astonished that you can get a house that looks like this for under $15,000. What's the secret? Location, location, location. In this case, a location on the top of a 12-foot pole on the front lawn, where this luxury dwelling can house an extended family of songbirds while matching the architectural style of its full-size counterpart. But it's fun to have a birdhouse that looks like your home. Something that has become the fastest growing segment in the mid-Atlantic real estate market, thanks to the efforts of a Wilmington designer named Tom Burke, a man who believes that a bird's home is his castle, and who uses his resourcefulness to make it one. Everything here is welcome out of our dumpster. This is a table laid off a chair. I used to build custom homes with my father, and then the building business got poor. And then I built a birdhouse for a friend of mine, and that was the beginning of his booming one-man housing industry that draws inspiration from everything from big-name high-rise condominium projects to the paintings of Andrew Wyeth and the artistic heritage that results in works that are fulfilling to the spirit, as well as the pocketbook. My houses have gone from $1,000 to $12,000. Is there a market for bird houses that require a mortgage? Yes, <laughs> yes. I have designed real houses before, but this is fun, and they, nobody complains about them. None of the birds have ever complained about the anything not working in them, so yes, it's yeah, a lot exactly. of times it's a lot better than, uh, <laughs> than building for homeowners. Besides, who doesn't like the delight that songbirds bring to your yard, especially after a long winter? Like people everywhere, the residents of the quiet community of Winona delight in the songbirds that herald the early days of spring. So you can imagine the reaction of townspeople a number of years back when they uh, looked out their kitchen windows and, and saw that. Looming like a gothic legion of doom in the trees, circling the skies in an ominous gyre, hundreds of vultures made the quaint and the world look like something out of an Alfred Hitchcock movie. People did not know what to make of it. They said, well, what are these birds doing here? Are they a danger? Are they going to attack my songbirds, eat my pets? fly off with my children, they didn't know. An unsettling presence at first, but one that has led to Winona having the distinction of being home to the largest roosting flock of vultures on the East Coast. Perhaps not as romantic as the swallows of Capistrano, but as it turns out, just as endearing. They're the kind of creature that, that grows on you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's become part of the local culture. They are now the basis of the town's annual Vulture Festival. To teach about the winged ones. We wanted to dispel all the myths and the misapprehensions, and it, it was a learning opportunity. I mean, if it wasn't for vultures, we'd be up to our necks in dead stuff. Are you hungry? Because we have some dead squirrel over there. Wouldn't that be Ew. Like, We have really embraced the vultures. Really, what choice do we have? <laughs> <laughs> They're here, so you might as well embrace them. <laughs> And I can get them here faster than the burrow to clean up a dead animal. <laughs> We've come to understand them. You know, in many cultures, vultures don't have these negative connotations. They're not Halloween birds. They're seen as, as beautiful creatures and as creatures of power. They're the spirit birds. In some cultures, they're the birds that are the link between the sky gods and the earth. And in one community, a presence that imparts a unique distinction in the spring when there's definitely something different in the air. And in the springtime, there's also something different underfoot that's also unwelcome in most places, except in this one town in New Jersey. <laughs> New Jersey, that state knows how to make the best of any situation. Check it out. Every spring they're viewed by homeowners as the amber blight on their front lawns, but the residents of Vineland, New Jersey, have taken a different approach to this springtime curse. If you can't beat them, eat them. This is our 38th Dandelion Festival. It's become quite a popular event. We get over 400 people here every year. Most people think it's a weed, but us here, we eat it. You can make dandelion pasta, dandelion and raviolis, dandelion with chicken, like a Roman chicken. You gotta jazz it up, though. Better. Better, very bitter, very bitter. People saute it in garlic and it kind of takes that bitterness out of the weed. It's not a weed, it's a, it's a 
You could call it a weed. The dandelion we're using for the festival in food is not really a weed, it's a cultivated vegetable. Nurtured and grown on area farms, all part of the love-hate dynamic residents here have with their semi-official civic flower and cash crop as best harvested before the yellow blossoms sprout. Now you don't want to eat the flower, you eat the leafy part. One year we had a dandelion jello. And that was with the flower, and we, we don't make that anymore. <laughs> that wasn't so great. Now, do you have to go in here and weed out the grass? Oh, is that what Yeah, you're... yeah, you want to keep the grass out of it. Just let the dandelion grow. We pick it when it's nice and green and ready for the salad bowl. No oil and vinegar, good to go. Uh, very versatile vegetable. Dandelion wine is very popular. Probably is what makes the rest of the cuisine popular, too. Right? Yes, probably. Although, in a taste that's similar to arugula, the cuisine is one that often quickly wins over newcomers. Once they try it, they're pleasantly surprised. This is very good, very tasty. And it's very good for you, too. Dandelion's actually got more vitamins than most vegetables. A quality which could turn what you previously was regarded as a springtime nuisance into a culinary trend whose popularity might start spreading. <laughs> of course, you're not going to be able to enjoy fine, fresh dandelions in the middle of January, but gourmands need not fear because while vegetable gardens all along the northeast coast lie dormant during the cold winter months, there's one local crop that is at the peak of its harvest. Must be the delight of oyster lovers everywhere. They reproduce in the springtime. They're fat. They haven't turned any of that energy into reproductive necessities. So they're perfect for eating. Oysters, best thing on the planet. People have been eating oysters for thousands of years. I like trying all the different kinds. We serve them raw. We do an oyster stew, we do fried oysters, we do roasted oysters. Pretty much oysters every way possible. A delicacy whose appeal is enhanced by its reputation as an aphrodisiac. With its Enhance romance. Of course. <laughs> For many years they've said that. For 50 years I've heard that. There is a, a slight chemical reaction. I mean, anything that has that sort of vitamin content, mineral content, the zinc, fresh salinity, pure protein, there's, it's going to make you feel good. Which perhaps justifies the efforts in just getting at what is one of the world's most labor intensive foods. What to do is stick the knife here, just twist the wrist. So each oyster is hand opened and you have to be able to slice into the shell without cutting the flesh of the oyster. Here's the knife, and see so you go to work. We've had people come in and, you know, learn from our shuckers. You're in the right spot. Put a little force in it and it'll pop your wrist. You have to be able to maintain the salt water with it and uh, just making it presentable. That's a tough muscle there. Are you talking about this muscle or, muscle or or this muscle? I'm talking about the oyster muscle. Oh, okay. But right. it's definitely a skill. You, you have to be careful what you're doing. It's a beautiful thing, an oyster. Very meaty, delicious. And there's also something very communal about eating oysters with somebody else. It's very interactive. Perhaps the basis of its association with love and romance and a seafood delicacy that remains on the cutting edge of gourmet cuisine. Coming up, another quirky entertainment delight that a growing number of people are embracing because it's the only Olympic sport that you and I actually might have a chance to compete in. We'll visit a young pool player who obviously flunked physics in high school, otherwise he'd know that this kind of a shot can't be done. Then later, we'll show you how you too can reach championship levels and get in the record books for doing whatever you think you're the best in the world at doing. I'm Don Pollock. All that and more is coming up in my world. open yourself up to a wide range of new experiences just by exploring quirky. If you've ever thought it's unfair that so many of us are closed out of participating in the Olympics just because we have no strength, no endurance, and no athletic ability, not to mention not wanting to risk breaking our necks, that's exactly the kind of thinking that draws so many people to facilities like this one. Where they can hone their skills in the curious Olympic sport known as curling. Curling originated 500 years ago in Scotland. Uh, like golf, it started as a social gathering. If you're a social curler, no, you don't really have to be an athlete. Uh, we have a, a woman, 82, that curls. Curls competitively. And then we have little kids. All part of teams that compete to try to slide a 42-pound granite stone across the ice and get closest to a target 150 feet away. In the only Olympic sport known to utilize household cleaning equipment. Sweeping is where you get most of your exercise in the sport of curling. You're warming the surface of the ice and that warming causes a film of water to form. So you're, in essence, hydroplaning the rock. 
You sweep it to go further, but you also sweep it to try and get around obstacles. It's like a combination of bowling and shuffleboard. Combining shuffleboard strategy and bowling's goofy looking shoes. One foot has a Teflon slider on it. If you notice, a lot of people slide up and down the ice with their Teflon shoes. Often whether they want to or not, but it's all part of the game that is available to everyone. Today we have men, women, children, and old and young and everybody. Who, with a little practice, can master the new nuances of a centuries-old Scottish tradition that could someday bring them a Winter Olympics medal in a sport that is able to generate the thrill of victory without the risk of injury. Of course, there are a number of sports, like pool for example, that aren't in the Olympics, but considering the way this one young master plays it, maybe it ought to be. Bill Markle wasn't really surprised when his son asked him for a pool table for Christmas back when he was 14 years old. And what we did was, okay, Steve, you sure you're going to use it? And he said, yeah. What did surprise him was what his son ended up doing with it. He said, hey, Dad, Mom, I want to show you something. And I said, how did you do that? Well, the answer is practice. That has made Steve Markle, at 19, the youngest professionally ranked trick shot artist in the country, with a website, a YouTube channel, and a repertoire that grows every week. Thousands of shots, yeah. I make them up, put them on diagrams like this, and uh, put them on the pool table and make them happen. Working his way around any obstacle that might be in his path, and using his equipment in ways more inspired by Rube Goldberg than Minnesota Fats, now, ordinarily, pool is a geometry-based game with lots of sharp angles and uh, straight lines. But uh, not so much the way Steve Markle plays it. In high school, I wasn't too great at math. With pool, I guess it's more interesting making them curve, making them draw, making them do everything, making the ball jump, jump off the table sometimes. Yeah, I have 13 or 14 broken tiles. The balls fly everywhere. And it's a dangerous thing, so watch the balls fly, guys. This is a craft fun and creative and it's a whole lot more entertaining than just shooting a simple ball in, I believe. And for Steve Markle, it's a passion that is embraced and supported by every member of his family. The uh, pool table is my canvas and I'm the artist. Just goes to show all you dogs out there that if you can get your master to be a champion at something, he'll let you on the furniture. And that leads us to our Web Wonder of the Week. A look at the marketplace bazaar of online treasures, and we do mean bazaar. Today we feature an online site that offers not merchandise, but pride, glory, and everything else that comes with a championship stack. A feeling that you and I can now have without participating in a major league playoff game through the website recordsetter.com that sanctions and certifies any world record achievement that you can dream up from most marshmallows stuffed into an open mouth to the greatest number of bench presses done in 30 seconds using a live dog. Our philosophy is that everybody on earth can be the world's best at something. Achievements that are witnessed every month by a live audience in New York City where officials from the World Record Database preside over a fundraising event where patrons get to witness the setting of world records in Go. the most times reciting a Japanese tongue twister in 30 seconds or the most times in a minute Go. of performing a flexibility exercise called the pretzel using a slide trombone. The achievements that admittedly aren't exactly Olympic caliber. Let's call it a second cousin to the Olympics. We have a little over 3,000 records right now. We have records all ages, 41 countries. Their website reflecting a universal yearning for recognition that you can recite more items from a Chinese menu in one minute than anybody else. We see a broad range of things. Today we were looking at the tallest tower of mini wheats. We get tons of competition in the most obscure categories you could imagine. Most peanuts smashed with a forehead on a kitchen counter. And we said, oh, this is funny, but nobody's ever going to beat this. And within a week, somebody had beaten it. And it's been beaten four or five times since then. And, and what's, what's the record? 17 in one minute. Oh, I could beat that. <laughs> well, that's the whole idea. Everybody likes the idea of being told that they're the world's best at something. We do have rules um, that the records have to be quantifiable and breakable. Um, but other than that, we encourage people to use their creativity. In ways that often leave a memorable impression and a lasting online legacy. We see people push the limits of what humans are capable of doing, and it's a fun, creative assignment. I'm Don Pollock, the holder of the new world record at... Uh, I forget. Well, it's 
spent some time in quite a few places in my world exploring quirky. So, what have we learned today? Well, we now know why the letter arrangement on today's smartphones is so dumb. It's to make life easier for all the 19th century stenographers out there who won't give up their Remingtons. Or maybe the alphabet's just been in the wrong order all these years. They're not the prettiest creatures, but they sure know how to host a party. It's fun, it's lively, and don't forget, it's bring your own carrion. And one man's blight is another man's entree. That seems to be the watchword at an annual banquet where the well-equipped kitchen includes skillets, knives, and weed whackers. You know, I never know what kind of amazing things I'm gonna come across in the world. But when I do, I'll be sure to bring them to you. And if you find something that makes you go, wow, that's quirky. Be sure to let me know. <laughs> in the meantime, do yourself a favor. Keep your eyes open for wondrous stuff. It's everywhere. I'm Don Pollock, and I'll see you next time in my world. Click on screen for more videos of extraordinary humans.